Thanks, Clint. So uh, we're continuing the class on uh, uh, walk, walk With Me, and, and uh, as Ed kind of thought that was an Aerosmith song, that was actually Walk This Way. A little, little different, right? But today we're going to be looking at uh, Understand Me, and th th these are studies from the Gospel of Mark, uh, which is kind of interesting because the book we're referring to is going to spend plenty of time in the Gospel of John, but, so it's not exclusive at all. Um, I put this one in just for Clint. I know you like the birds, so there you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, so right off the bat, have, have you ever felt misunderstood or even maybe understood but rejected for either who you are, what you've done, what you've said? Um, have you ever had trouble being understood by your coworkers, your friends, even your family? Uh, and I know it's kind of like a really personal question. I don't actually intend for, you know, like real answers because that, that can get kind of difficult at times. Um, for myself, I, I recall a few times, I, I remember a, a low time, uh, freshman, sophomore year in college, where I was actually kind of walking around the university like late, late in the evening, trying to finish up some work in January, and it, it, was, it was cold. Okay, it was like mild, because this was Arizona, so it was mild and windy, uh, and I just kind of felt, you know, alone, like I didn't have a lot of close relationships, like I was really reaching out for people, but there weren't a lot of people there, kind of like just, you know, walking down a a dark street. You can almost imagine like the jazz music playing in the background, right? You know, it's good. Uh, at other times, though, we, we've had some other incidences, you know, uh, incidents with our family members um, that have made spending time together difficult, awkward, even impossible for a time. And I know that that's very, sadly, very typical. Family in particular uh, can, can prove to be a challenge. Um, uh, hopefully not your immediate family as much as your extended family, but, you know, that's a different subject. So G Jesus, he also had this, this difficulty of dealing with rejection and difficulties in relationships, even with his immediate family. Let's look at a couple of verses here. Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Psalm 69, uh, verses 7 through 8. For it is for your sake that I have been that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. These are prophecies about the Messiah, about God's chosen one. Um, how about what John has to say at the beginning of his gospel? John chapter one, verses ten through eleven. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Uh, and this is interesting too. I think uh, one of our maybe multiple of our lectureship speakers refer to this, this verse in particular. Just the, the I was going to call it irony, but more like tragedy, that the creator, that the, the fact that the world was made through Jesus, but that he wasn't actually, you know, received by his own people. But, I mean, this is the Messiah, right? This is the Son of God. I mean, it, it's kind of like the song we sing, Man of Sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. You, you think about this isn't like our favorite title for, for Jesus, right? I found this word cloud on the internet, and I had to highlight Man of Sorrows because it was kind of hard to see. It's one of the smaller, you know, texts. It's not like our, our favorite title for Jesus, right? Um, but Jesus was a man of sorrows. I mean, we understand or we try to understand what that means. What does it mean that, that Jesus ex experienced sorrow? We think every Sunday about the sorrow that Jesus experienced on the cross but there must have been other, other sorrows in some of his interaction with, with his own creation, right? And not even being received, not even being understood by a lot of the people that he taught or spoke to. You can think of the verses where he says, Woe to you, Chorazin, or woe to you, Bethsaida. I mean, a lot of people that Jesus interacted with, they didn't understand what was going on, or they didn't have a soft heart to hear what he was actually saying. Um, so let's turn this morning. We've been looking at, at Mark. We're going to turn to Mark chapter 3. I've got the, the passage up on the screen here, but you can also uh, put a bookmark here because this is where we're going to be today. So Mark chapter 3, uh, verse 20 and 21. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. I think part of Jesus' sorrows, part of his difficulty on earth, part of his frustration had to be at being misunderstood and being rejected. I mean, here it seems like his family is actually, you know, coming to take charge of him. This is almost like an intervention, right? Uh, 
okay, Jesus, he's gone too far this time. Actually, sounds like something else. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's, we, we have to go and take charge of this guy. We got to rein him back in. He's just running around like a madman. And this isn't the first time that Jesus has, has been misunderstood. I mean, uh, we think about when, when Jesus was 12 years old at the temple. Uh, in Luke 2.50, after Jesus says, Do you not know that I must be at my father's house? The Bible says, speaking of his parents, uh, his earthly parents, Joseph and Mary, and they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. They didn't get it. Uh, we can also think about um, Jesus' brothers. Here they're coming to, to take charge of him. But in uh, John chapter 7, verse 5, where they're talking about, they're trying to goad him into going down uh, to Jerusalem, to a festival, it's, the text says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. For not even his brothers believed in him. That's right. But let's look at the immediate context. If you have your Bibles open to John chapter, uh, excuse me, Mark chapter 3, if we look right after this passage, so it's, it's interesting right off the bat to see in verse 20, he went home. So he's, he's in, uh, in Capernaum in Galilee. So this is actually in his, you know, like his home court. And we know that Jesus has always uh, struggled to be accepted at home. He's rejected in Nazareth. Um, and now he's going to even be running into additional problems. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot uh, stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. Uh, and then he gets even more serious with his wording, jumping down to verse 29. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Um, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So even, even in his own house, you got people coming to him and accusing him of driving out demons by the, the prince of demons. So even in the immediate context, uh, Jesus is being terribly misunderstood or misrepresented. I mean, he's, again, he's at home. He came to save humanity. And now he's thought to be, you know, crazy and demon-possessed. So if, if it's me at this point, this might be, you know, my reaction if I was Jesus, right? The face bump. I mean, these people just don't get it. And certainly, again, you get that impression sometimes from reading some of the, some of the Gospels when he's, like, saying, woe to you, Chorizon, woe to you, Bethsaida. It's like, come on, guys. Or, you know, are you still so dull, right? And this is the same old, uh, the, we, we've heard this, this discussion before. C.S. Lewis kind of put it this way, that Jesus, if he's claiming to be the son of God, he's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. I mean, if he sincerely uh, uh, believes what he's saying, that he's the son of God, but he's not, he's crazy, he's a lunatic. If he doesn't believe what he's saying, if he knows that he's lying, then he's a liar. Otherwise, he's telling the truth. But right now, his uh, family is firmly in this camp, right? Lunatic. They think he's out of his mind. But let's think about this, actually, for a minute. Let's ask, are these charges potentially true? Is he really out of his mind, as the scripture is saying? I mean, we know he's not, but let's consider a different perspective. Let's consider his family's perspective. Let's talk about uh, this, this phrase right here in, in Mark uh, chapter 3, where it says he's out of his mind. It literally means he's standing outside of or to be beside oneself, to be eccentric. Now, this is kind of a funny word, eccentric, right? What, is it, what does it uh, necessarily mean? Um, I'll ask the class. What, what does eccentric mean? Does it just mean crazy? Odd. Yeah, it could mean a little odd, right? A little off. Different than most people around you? Yeah. Yeah, were you going to say different as well? Yeah, different? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I heard about, uh, I remember one time hearing this word. It's funny, too, to like Google, Google image search like eccentric. You get a lot of Salvador Dali stuff, right? <laughs> He's messing with his beard or whatever, or his mustache. Um, but I heard this used once about a, a wealthy Englishman who built a trebuchet to throw cars around his, his property, right? Okay, that's, you know, a little odd. It's kind of a little cool, maybe, but, you know, it, it seems a bit different, a bit eccentric. I've also heard it said before, if you're, um, 
if you're wealthy and you're crazy, then you're not crazy, you're eccentric, right? I mean, it's just like a different standing, right? You're not going to call, you know, a wealthy person crazy. Right. Exactly. Yeah, out of center. It's, it's the people that are doing things that you wouldn't normally think about doing. Right. Yep. Like that. Like throwing cards. Like, like throwing cards. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So Jesus, when he's you know giving the Sermon on the Mount, he's teaching not the way the other rabbis would teach. Right? Mm-hmm. His teachings right. are human-centric. Right. Apart from the normal, the normal ideas of the day. Yeah, exactly. Apart from the normal ideas of the day. And from that perspective, maybe Jesus does fit the bill. Maybe not lunatic, but maybe you could say eccentric. Uh, and that's very good. You were talking about kind of that definition of that spectrum politically. I actually did. I Googled the definition, right? This is Merriam-Webster's. And yeah, we understand this first one here, but deviating from conventional or accepted usage uh, or conduct, especially in odd or whimsical ways. So I don't know if we can necessarily say Jesus was, was whimsical, although we're going to see his response here in a second. It's a little whimsical. Um, but down here at the bottom, right, deviating from a circular path, or how about this one right here? Located elsewhere than at a geometric center. If everything is revolving around one point, you're eccentric if you're revolving around a different point or not even paying attention to that point. You can kind of talk about eccentric orbits, right? Is is an orbit going to be circular or is it going to be like oblong? So they refer to this in in, um, astronomy as well. Uh, You can kind of visualize it like this. Um, These three circles have different um, centers to them. And so they are eccentric from each other, like mathematically. So from the world's perspective, yeah, I think Jesus could be thought of as eccentric, certainly odd, certainly misunderstood and, and, uh, uh, at times. Um, so what was Jesus' center? If it was different, if we look at this idea of eccentric being a different center, what is his center? What is his balance? And here's where we're going to hop on over to a couple of verses from the Gospel of John. Because John actually makes it very clear through his writings, Jesus makes it clear in the Gospel of John, uh, what his center is. Let's take a look at John 4.34. Uh, when Jesus is interacting with the, uh, with the woman at the well, he says, uh, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. His disciples are coming to him, hey, let's go get some food. And he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Or in John 5.30, he says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. How about a few more from the Gospel of John? John 6.38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It's kind of starting to sound like a, like a repeated phrase, right? Uh, John 8.38b, I do nothing of my own authority, but I speak just as the Father taught me. And John 14, 31, A, I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. So looking at these uh, verses from uh, the Gospel of John, what would you say that Jesus' center is? What is his first importance? What is, he, uh, what is he focused on? The will of God. The will of God, yeah, absolutely. And he, as he puts it, his Father, yes? Right. Because from the beginning, it was predicted what he was going to do, that he knew if a baby went away from the center, he was going to be there. Yeah, yeah, very good. That is another way to look at it. You know, I was also thinking about um, one of my favorite analogies because I was a big marching band nerd in, in high school. I was going to put up a picture of, of what does it mean to be, like, out of step. Uh, and if you've ever done marching band or served in the military and you're supposed to be in step with the, you know, left, right, left, I guess that's the military version, right? But it, it's kind of, it, the old joke is, I'm not out of step, everyone else is out of step, right? And I think it's that same, that same kind of idea. Jesus might be the only one in step with God and everyone else not, not following along with that. Yeah, so the will of God was his, his, uh, was his center. It was his food. It was his nourishment. Let's go back to Mark uh, chapter 3, if you're still there. So Jesus' mother and brothers have come to take charge of him. Again, this is like an intervention. Let's read Jesus' response. And in some ways, you could say that this actually fits uh, whimsical. Mark 3, uh, verse 31. 
And his mother and brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and brothers are outside, seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. You know what's interesting about that verse, too? And this might just, again, be, be how I read it. Um, I don't see him doing the face palm here. Like, oh, here we go again, right? These people just don't get it. This is one of those times where if, if you've seen some of these movies that try to represent the Gospels, you kind of imagine, I imagine, Jesus smiling, right, when he's saying this. He's, he's a, you know, surrounded by people that are actually trying to get it. That It's kind of funny, too, talking about being eccentric, talking about being at the center. He's actually kind of at the center of this group right now that is interested in, in what he is teaching. Uh, and you, you can kind of imagine him saying this, again, with a smile, that he's, he says, these people, uh, the people that do the will of God, they are my brother and sister and mother. And I think that gets back to what you're saying, that they are, they're looking to share that, uh, that center, to have the will of God at the very core, just like we talked about in the Gospel of John. Okay, so any thoughts on that before we you know, plow ahead? I feel like I'm just clicking through slides quickly. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, I think I'm going to get to that actually in the slide. Very good. <laughs> so, excellent. But if we contrast this with the world, maybe again, if we say that the, the world's off center, what, what would the center of the world be? Well, the world's center might be selfishness. In fact, this does kind of feel like our natural tendency as well. I found a couple of different, uh, you know, images for this. And we probably heard this actually more from our parents, right? Like either the world doesn't revolve around you or you're not the center of the universe, right? But sometimes it feels like that because that's kind of my, you know, perspective. Um, I look out for what I want to do. I look out for, for myself, right? Um, we, we do have a natural inclination to focus on ourselves and on what we want to do. And I think if we step aside, if we step aside from what our will is and what God's will is, that will make us different. And we can see this as well. Let's go forward to, uh, to 1 Peter chapter 4, familiar words to us. Um, Peter writes, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. What is their center? What is their focus? Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Again, a focus on themselves, a focus on what they want to do. Let's contrast that. Um, they are surprised that you do not join in their uh, reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. This is going to be surprising to the world. You're going to be thought of as odd. They think it odd, right, uh, that you're not going to be doing, doing the same things. You're going to be eccentric to the world. Um, I think it was, I think Clint said it a lot, right? If you're, not, if you're not a little weird as a Christian, according to the world, if you're not different, you're probably not doing it right. Um, and and uh, uh, that, that can be, you know, difficult to accept sometimes, and it can be, you know, frustrating as well. There's actually also a, we, we think about a, a, a Japanese proverb here, the nail that sticks out usually gets hammered down. Um, this, this usually talks about, you know, conformity, right? If you're, uh, or maybe it's the squeaky wheel gets the, uh, gets the grease kind of thing, right? As Christians, the world's going to try to hammer us down. And we, we see this even today, right? We're now called closed-minded bigots. We're called hurtful. Uh, maybe we're just called old-fashioned. I was going to say, you know, goody two-shoes, but I don't think I've ever been really called that. Maybe that's what they did back in the 50s, right? But people are going to think that you're different, that you're odd. But let's think about Jesus as well. Let's consider some of his uh, relationships. And this is where we're getting back to that verse that you're talking about. John chapter 15, you nailed it. Uh, verses 18 through 20. Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would have loved you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the, world, the, the word that I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep 
they will also keep yours. So you can kind of see this contrast again. Jesus is talking about being called out of the world, called away from that center, and to focus on God instead. Yes, Clint? Maybe take that uh, angle and get down. Yeah. Think of that expression. That's, well, that's really what Jesus was the problem on. If he was, if he was sticking out of his culture, trying to, I mean, what we know, trying to fulfill what Judaism was, was, was supposed to be pointing towards. Right. But Right. And, we, and you can think also just about how Jesus's relationships, even on this earth, how they narrowed uh, to the point of the cross. Right. At times, um, uh, Jesus was very popular. At times he was feeding 5000 and they wanted to make him kings. At other times he was intentionally uh, testing the crowd. He was thinning, thinning the crowds. Um, I mean, you think about Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem, they're worshiping him as he's entering. Within a week, they're going to be crucifying him. Um, even all of his disciples deserted him. I mean, they didn't really understand what was going on, so we can't blame him for that. Um, but they didn't understand Jesus' mission as well, but, but we can. We certainly can. So what do we do as Christians when we're, when we're misunderstood? First of all, let's turn to our center. Turn to your center, a shared center, and that's going to be the same thing as Jesus's. You know, we talked about his mission, our mission, uh, as was our theme Uh, a couple years ago. How about Jesus' center, our center, God's will? This isn't about our beliefs or our will. It's not about what we think is right. It's about representing God and what he wants. If we go back to 1 Peter, very familiar words, 1 Peter 3, 15, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So I think I might say on that, you know, like, examine your defense, X, Y, D, right? Is it your own reasoning? Is it your own words? Or is it God's will, God's words, when we're challenged on these things, when we're challenged to be hammered down? What is going to be our center? What are we going to focus on? I think of the song um, very often, one of my favorite songs in the songbook. It's an old, older song, Sweet Will of God, right? My stubborn will at last has yielded. Sweet will of God still fold me closer, that idea of, you know, putting myself aside and instead focusing on God, putting, changing my center, changing my focus. And then secondly, when we're misunderstood, we can turn to our God-given human support group. And in this case, when you look at back at Mark chapter 3, he is, uh, he's looking around at the group and he says, who are my mother and my brothers? And he says, here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. So... Um, uh, obviously the conclusion for us is the same, right? If we're focused on the will of God, we're together in God's family, that's going to be uh, the church. So we're part of this family through Christ. Let's encourage one another and help strengthen one another when we're misunderstood as Christians. So pretty simple today. Make sure that we maintain our, our center, focus on God's will, and then try to support one another as we do that, as we're misunderstood, thought odd, thought eccentric by the world. Uh, any other thoughts? Okay, I did. Yes, Rebecca. I'm like, I did breeze through that a little too quickly. Right.
No, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, you also think about um, other lists, like in you know, like contrasting the the fruit of the spirit, right, with the um, with the desires of the flesh. But you're right; it doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be like the obvious, what we consider to be like the really bad sins. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yep. Well, I, I think along those lines that, you know, I think part of maybe a major part of how we are misunderstood as Christians is, you know, it, 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 it's easy to, I mean, I, I guess it's more natural to think of the way in these churches it's easy to dismiss aesthetics not being, you know, not being as good because of where your, where your position was. Mm-hmm. Right. The major sins. That, that there still is. I mean, that there still is a need for repentance. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that there, there still is a struggle. You know, that I, mean, I, I don't know if it was in here last week or, or two weeks ago, whatever it was. The, you know, the, the impression, if, if, if we're given the impression that we're perfect because we're Christians or because we're Christians, we're perfect. Right. That's us being misunderstood and it's us causing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly not a, a, uh, any kind of arrogance to it. It's just more of a, a different focus. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Adam, did you have something as well? make different decisions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good good point. Yeah. If we if we keep making the same decisions, we'll get the same results. Yep. Very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good thought. Any other thoughts? Okay, I'll give you Oh, Clint, you got another? Yeah, yeah, please. I, I, I do think it's interesting. Here that, comes the spirit. That, that even the forces that, right. uh, that, that Jesus even is, the, is an example of saying, you know, I, even if my family turns against me, even if, even if my family doesn't understand who I am, mm-hmm. these are the people that I'm, I'm going to turn to. You know, these, the, these are the people that I, and I mean, yep. who, who in the history? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you also think of what uh, Jesus' other teachings on this, right, where he says the, the, uh, the enemies will be the people in your own house, in your own family, that living this way, living differently, will cause um, division, will cause strife with the world. Yeah, 
And um, it's all the more reminder that we need each other. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah, please. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, by being different, you're also going to be letting your light shine and you're going to and people will start to wonder why why is it that you do what you do? Why is it that you don't do what you do? Why is it that you're different? Very good. That could be an opportunity. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Great thought. Okay, thank you all this morning. Uh, just a reminder, please again pick up the survey from the lectureship. And this evening, if you're able, um, after evening services, there'll be um, time of fellowship in the fellowship hall and, uh, and a meal. Thanks.